so powerful and shook the religious institution like an earthquake. But actually, Lord, afterwards when the scars were healed, Lord, people's lives were restored. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you speak um, just such incredible words to us. And so we, we just want to wanna read from your word today. We want to meditate in your word. We want to find things in your word that will help us in our journey and in our walk with you, in our purpose, in the plans that you have for each of our lives. We pray that you bless this word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, I was reading today's passage um, earlier in the week, and it, and it got me thinking about foundations, got me thinking about foundations. You know, foundations are key, aren't they, in anything that we do. And, you know, if we're going to build anything of significance, we need to constantly consider the foundations, yeah? You know, this year, our theme and focus for the church is actually renewed foundations, and so when I was preparing this, I thought, oh, yeah, that's our theme for this year, renewed foundations, because, of course, we want to renew the foundations in the church. You know, foundations are critical for our lives. They're critical for our home lives. They're critical for the, the church, aren't they? And so Peter, in our passage today, talks a lot about foundations. He talks a lot about foundations. And, of course, um, I've had the privilege of having a father who, a father-in-law who's who, who, was, who was one of the chief engineers at Pilkington Glass. He worked all over the world building glass factories. Um, and so I've grown to really appreciate engineers. Years ago, I would have stayed clear of them, you know, because, oh, no, don't kill me with the detail. But engineers, engineers are brilliant people. And, of course, engineers know the importance of good foundations and, and um, actually spend years looking at the foundations before... They work on the superstructure sometimes when they're working on a huge project. And so uh, there's lots of huge buildings, aren't there, in our world? And I was, I was, I was, looking, at, um, I was looking at some of them. And, uh, of course, the Twin Towers in Malaysia. I don't know if you've seen those. The Twin Towers in Malaysia absolutely spectacular. And um, apparently the Twin Towers in Malaysia have the deepest foundations of any structure in the world. Their foundations... Um, are huge. But uh, that's not the tallest building. The tallest building in the world is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. And, um, and uh, that's a huge building. But, but I'm more interested in the foundations today. You know, the depth of the foundations of, of one of the other biggest buildings in the world, the, uh, the Twin Towers in Malaysia, the depth of the foundations of that building are, are an incredible depth. 120 meters. Can you, get, can you get that? 120 meters? I, you know, I can't even imagine what 120 meters looks like. That's massive. And so the, the uh, Burj Khalifa in Dubai, only 50 meters. Uh, in comparison to the Shard, the UK's biggest building, 60 meter foundations. So it's like double, double the length, double the depth. And so the big idea is this. Foundations are crucial. Foundations are crucial, friends. And so Paul... Writing to the churches in Turkey, uh, we're going through the book of Peter, and this is a letter to various churches across Turkey, Asia Minor, as it used to be called. And so Paul writing to the churches in Turkey, wanting them to understand key things that would be foundational for them as they looked ahead into a season that was was not looking good. You know, uh, Paul foresaw persecution. There was already kind of um, light persecution, but Paul, Paul foresaw that getting worse. And so... And so he, he wanted to give them foundations that would take them through difficult times, difficult seasons. And so what he says about foundations in this passage that we're going to look at today is crucial for churches in all generations to understand. We're going to be reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. They're going to come up on the screen just now. Um, but some really, really cool stuff in here. I love it. It says this. It says, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious. precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And there's a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so we're going to finish uh, just there. Um, But there's some really, really great things in those four verses for us this morning. Um, This passage, in this passage, Peter talks about uh, a few things. He talks about the, the role Christians play in being foundational. So we, we, the roles we play in being foundational. He talks about our central foundation, and he talks about how we have been built for the purpose of declaration. They're the three things that I want to focus on today. So firstly, Paul talks about the part we play in the foundations of the church. And he tells us that we need to be rock hard people. Rock hard. That's what he tells us, you know. And so I was thinking about that. I was thinking, you know, about all of us. I think if we think about it, you know, we can all think for a moment just now about rock hard people we know who we really admire, can't we? Just think for a minute about some rock hard people that you know I can think of so many when I was thinking about that I was thinking wow John Cave you know I was thinking Paul Hallam I was thinking I was thinking Howard Davenport I was thinking uh, I was thinking Gerard Homer I was thinking James Meggers I was thinking of like so many different people David Wilkerson uh, you know David Pawson you know rock hard people Rock hard people. We've all got people we, we admire, haven't we? And so a lot of those names you, you won't be aware of, you won't know. <laughs> uh, some of them you might. But, you know, when we think about it, we've all got people in our lives like that, haven't we? I can think of so many, and that's just a few. But what are they like? They're dependable people. They're people who, who stick around. They're people who aren't easily intimidated. They're, they're people who can handle a fight. Yeah? Think about the Bible uh, for a minute. Think about people in the Bible who who were rock hard. (laughs) There's so many, aren't there? You know, God's people aren't softies, are they? And so I was thinking about Nehemiah when he rebuilt the walls and he's saying to the people, right, we've got to be rock hard. We've got to have a trowel in one hand. We've got to have a sword in the other. So while they were rebuilding the walls, they were ready for a fight. Yeah? Yeah. I was thinking about Stephen and his, his speech in the book of Acts. I mean, you know, he's speaking to the Sanhedrin. He's speaking to the, the religious officials. They're wanting to kill him. And then he gives this massive talk about, you know, how right from the very time God planned for Jesus to come and be the saviour, the Messiah, the redeemer. And he wanted to point out to them the obvious and, and, of course, he was rock hard in that moment. Deborah, the, the warrior queen, when there were no men in the nation who would stand up for God anymore. You know, God had Deborah, and she was rock hard. And she went into wars and fought battles. And, and you, you've got the guy um, who, who was a sidekick. I can't even remember his name. He's that insignificant. Uh, does anyone, can anyone remember his name? The, the wimpy guy. The passive guy. I can't, we can't remember him, can we? And so, I, I, to be honest, I should have had him written down, then I could have told you, but I've not got him written down, because who cares? We care about Deborah, don't we? Because she was a warrior queen, and she got the nation out of trouble. You know, what were their qualities? What can we learn? We learned that they were rock hard. And so Peter says, this is what 
we need to be like. And I want to tell you, there's never been a time in a season in church history where when Christians have got to stand up and be rock hard. There's never been a time like there, there is right now. And so in our passage today, Peter um, gets his recipients to focus on, on the most rock hard person in the whole of human history, to focus on Jesus. And so he talks about Jesus being the living stone in verse 4. You know, that we are like living stones. We're like living stones. Jesus was a living stone. When we come into relationship with Jesus, we're like living stones. We're rock hard, but we're full of life. Living stones being built into a spiritual house in verse 5. You know, as, as believers in Turkey who were hearing this letter read for the first time, they would have been thinking about two things when, uh, you know, Peter was saying, you know, we come to the living stone, Jesus. We like living stones. This is how we've got to be. They would have been thinking about two things. They would have been thinking about ancient Bible passages that talked about the foundation stone of the people of God being rejected sometime in the future, that Jesus was described himself as a foundation stone being rejected by the leaders that Jesus even said, you know, the, he, he said this of himself. Jesus actually said these words, the stone the, the builders are rejecting is going to become the capstone, the chief stone. And so the second thing they would have thought about, and I love this, because Peter's writing this, I, I love this. The second thing they would have thought about is, is that, um, the th second thing they th would have thought about was Peter, who Jesus described as a rock on which he could build. Jesus said of Peter, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I'll build my church and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. Imagine having that said over your life. And so people say, oh, well, Jesus was talking about himself here. You know, I think there's a bit of that. But I think he's also talking about Peter. He's saying, I see something in you, Peter. You're rock hard. You're the first one to like stand up and fight for this cause that we've got, this gospel that we've got to declare. It was Jesus, uh, Peter, of course, who stood up on the day of Pentecost because he was rock hard. There'd been something very rock hard put in him when he saw his saviour crucified on the cross and risen from the dead and thought, wow, this is what we're here to live for. This is what we're here to tell the world for, that the saviour's come, that the Messiah's come, that there's hope, that we can be forgiven, that we can be restored, that we can have life. And so, Peter said, you know, Jesus said, I tell you, you were Peter on this rock. So they would have been thinking of that. And so what I love about this passage is that Peter flips his rock-hard credentials onto the Christians that he's writing to. And he says, this rock-hard character... Friends, it's not just for me. It's not just for me to, to, to be rock hard in, in belief is a character trait we've all got to have in these days. Persecution's coming, it's getting harder. To be rock hard in belief is a character trait we must all have. And so Jesus wants to build on the rock in you. He wants to build on the rock in me. He wants to build on the rock in us as he built on the rocking, rock-like character in, in Peter. So Peter's saying to them, you know, I don't want to be a Christian pin-up poster guy that you all get gushy over. I don't want to be the superstar guy. I don't want to be that guy. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to be on the cover of Christianity magazine I'm not a cover guy, I'm a rock hard guy. That's what Peter's saying in this passage. I want you to toughen up. I want you to become rock like. I want you to become hard like me, hard like the Lord. He says, You also, like living stones, are to be foundational people. And that's a word over our lives. We're the living stones of the church, each one of us in here, and we're to be foundational people. You do, you, you know, we've got to be something God can build on. Can God build on us? We've got to be something our friends and family can build on when they see our lives and they see the way that we live. Rock hard foundational people. And so the question is this. You know, what are we building on? 
or what we're building. Not just in our lives, in our home lives, but what we're building for the Lord. You know, we're the people of God. we got to build this thing. What are we building for the Lord? Do our lives just pass us by? Or do we have a plan in place? Do we know the goals God has for our lives? You know, when people look at us outside of our, outside of our Sunday moments, what do they see? You know, do they see rock-hard, dependable, strategic people? Do they see faith that is growing, deepening, solidifying? Do they see Jesus? Do they see rock-hard, immovable faith? You see, Peter knew that um, one stone, his own life, built on the rock Christ Jesus, the foundation of the church wasn't enough. He knew it wasn't enough. And here he is inviting his hearers and requesting that they lock in their rock-hard lives alongside him as living stones becoming um, similar similar rock-like people. And so he, he reminds them that something glorious happens when we lock our rock together. You know, I was at Spring Harvest, as I said earlier, you know, and I was just looking at the teams there. It's just a dream. You see all these teams, and they're all like super pumped because they're serving God. And, and then you've got all these teams. You've got the kids team, and you've got the PA team, and you've got the worship team, and you've got all the speaking team, and you've got all, all, the, all the people doing all, all, all the stewarding. And, 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 and what, what we see in, in Spring Harvest, you know, what you see here Sunday by Sunday is people do different things and serve coffee at the back, and you're seeing priests in action. It's a priesthood. It's a priesthood, and so Spring Harvest is like, wow, it's a priesthood, it's a priesthood, this is how it should be. And of course, that's a, mom m that's a momentary thing, it's like a week long, but it's a picture of what the church should look like. You know, when we lock together, a priesthood of believers emerges, and we together, as a spiritual house, reach more people together than we do alone. And so we create a home where God is worshipped, where people are trained in mission, where the battered come and meet Jesus and get healed. You know, the building means nothing. Living stones locked together are everything, friends. Everything. And so Peter is here saying, you know, don't expect growth and strength to come from me alone. Don't get frustrated at me because my ministry is finite and has limited elasticity. That's what he's saying to the church. He's saying, step up, play your part as priests in the church, in your family, in your work setting. Be a person who elevates Christ and his people. He's saying, you do something about your frustration as fellow priests. Toughen up, train up, start lifting some spiritual weight. And so his message to the, the churches that he's ministering to is, look, look, I can't be in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I don't own a Tesla. I don't fly a private jet. I go by foot, I take a boat or two, it's slow, and, and often when I go, I go alone. And so there's a proverb which says, go alone, go slow. Go together, go far. And so often, you know, we look around the church, we look at each other and we grumble. We don't have this, we don't have that. We, we have no minister, minister's doing the priestly stuff that we we're, we're really dig, that we're into. We look around at the lack of gift and we think that we think that way, don't we, sometimes? And so, you know, I think when we think that way, let me tell you this, we're always going to be followers because pioneers do much with nothing. Pioneers do much with nothing. You know, if you're thinking about the lack, if you're thinking about what we don't have, if you're thinking about how there's no gift around you, you're always going to be a follower. And so Peter's message to the church is, 
Why not instead work with what you have and let God do the rest? Work with what you have and become a leader. Become a leader. You know, God's not like us. He sees with different eyes. We're, we're at Spring Harvest, there's a speaker there, a guy called John O'Connor. He runs a ministry called Junction 24. He's in prison um, for, for many, many, many things. Tragic, tragic start to life. Um, he, his father was in and out of prison all the time himself. Uh, he, he, his, his mother had constant affairs. And so he, he said to his mum, look, if you don't stop the affairs, I'm going to write to dad in prison and tell him. So she kept on having these affairs. And so he wrote to his dad in prison. Dad came home and murdered his mum. Young 12-year-old kid saw blood on the bedroom floor, murdered. Uh, you know, his dad murdered his mum. Just a tragic, tragic story. And he got saved in prison, became a Christian. And started this ministry called Junction 24 to, to, uh, to prisoners. And, of course, Spring Harvest this year has been streamed out to prisoners, prisons all over the UK, all over the world. Incredible. And so he was talking about dreaming out. After he'd come out of prison, after he'd become a Christian, come out of prison, you know, paid for his crimes. Um, he had a dream, and in the dream, God took him back to the prison he was at. Um, he had a dream, and in the dream, God took him back to the prison he was at. And God took him through the prison, through all the prison corridors, and he started seeing all these different faces, and God said, what do you see in the dream? And so he says in the dream, back to God, you know, I see murderers, I see pedophiles, I see rapists, I see people who've committed fraud, I see all these things, and God spoke back to him, and he said, God said this to him, and oh, I tell you, if I could take only one thing away from spring harvest, it'd be this, God said, spoke back to him and said this, I see kings. I see kings. I thought that was so powerful. Because, you know, you see, when you think about uh, a, a drug dealer in his, working in his area, that guy operates like a king. That guy knows how to operate like a king. And you see, when someone like that's redeemed from that kind of lifestyle and put into a different context, a Christian context, they start living for God, they take that, that kingship and use it for, for the purposes of the law, for the purpose of the kingdom of the God, for the purposes of the gospel, for the purposes of seeing people redeemed. And so, and, so, and so that's really, really powerful. And so the point is this, you know, God sees different to the way we see. God looks at things different to the way we look at them. You know, God looks around prisons, he sees, he sees priests, he sees kings. You know, when God looks around the church, when he looks around at you guys, he sees a royal priesthood of believers. He sees priests. And so Peter says to us in this passage, don't grumble. Just come and speak to me about how you can minister as priests, offering spiritual sacrifices pleasing to God. And so we have to make space to... Uh, to uh, space... Uh, um, and we have to sacrifice our time if we're going to be ministers for the Lord, don't we? We have to create space to serve. We have to sacrifice time so we can minister. I was thinking about um, one of Katie's friends, a guy called Hig, and uh, I, I had the pleasure of seeing his, his wonderful face again on social media, and it kind of brought him back to memory, but um, he was at university with Katie, and when he finished, he, he got a degree in accounts, and... and he didn't go straight into accountancy. What he did, he, he, um, he graduated and he got a job as a postman. Because he thought, I'm not married, I'm going to serve the Lord. And so he was a postman and then he just served in the church for the rest of his time. He, 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 he engineered his life so he could work and serve the church. Of course, when he got married and he had kids, he thought, right, it's now, now time to use my degree. and became an accountant. But... But, you know, uh, what was he doing? He was making space. He was sacrificing time to minister. And so, friends, let's understand that, you know, that's how we've got to be. Let's understand that most ministry is not behind a microphone. Most ministry is helping living stones lock in so that they're built into a spiritual house, verse 5. You know, serving, practical help's, 
kids and youth ministry, community engagement, tech, media, alpha course, welcome team, uh, seniors ministry, you know, leading small groups. That's, that's, that's where people get locked in, friends, because they're things that we do around relationship. And so, and so they're the kind of areas we need to think, wow, could serve in those areas. You know, Paul goes on in this passage to remind his recipients that, and I love this, they're building on reliable foundations, verses 6 to 8. You know, we've seen, haven't we, from the carnage of war-torn, war-torn, uh, war-torn areas like Ukraine and Gaza, we've seen strong buildings collapse in, in a season of war, haven't we? You know, the earthquakes just last week in America and Taiwan are a reminder to us that no matter how deep the foundations, man-made buildings creak, and man-made buildings fall, friends. And I guess the same things, will, you know, appeared in the news in, in the days when Peter wrote his letter to the churches of Turkey. You know, Turkey was, is, is a country that still sits on, on major fault lines, and so there's lots of earthquakes there all the time. And so Peter wanted to remind the believers that Jesus is the only truly reliable foundation that we have. And so here he quotes Isaiah 28, verse 18, and he says, um, uh, what, what does he say? See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And he writes this because we as people and as believers have a habit of laying all kinds of foundations in our lives. You know, the foundations I I laid in my life before I became a Christian are very different from the foundations I have now. You know, for some, their foundation is is debt. They just leverage their life on debt. For some, it's savings. They're so ultra-cautious. They're constantly saving. For some people, their foundation is their career. The career is everything. For some people, their reputation is everything. Don't slander my reputation. For some people, family is everything. It's all about family. They're so family is so tight, it's toxic. For some people, it's friends. For some people, it's their education. Education's their God. For some people, business instincts is, is all they live for, the buzz of the deal. For some, it's marriage. My marriage is everything. For some, it's relationships. And you know, all of these things are key and they're crucial in our lives, but even these things are subject to change, friends. And so if they're foundational things, they can change. And if we have nothing else, and that's all we're relying on, our world can completely collapse when these things go. And so Paul reminds the believers here that we need a more central and reliable foundation in our lives in a season of change. He reminds the believers that Jesus is that foundation, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And so when we think of those chosen and precious cornerstones, you know, a cornerstone was, was placed above two walls and, and principally was put there to keep the walls together to prevent the building from falling apart. And so Peter is reminding the church that Jesus is this stone in verse 7. Peter is reminding the churches that even though tough times are ahead, um, you know, if what, what they're building genuinely has Jesus at the center, listen, it's not going to fall. It's not going to fall. No matter how bad things look, it's not going to fall. And so churches can go through seasons of challenge. But when Jesus is what we're building on, new stones can be added and the church can always be renewed. The church can always recover. And so how reliable are our foundations? You know, do we treat Jesus and his his church like an insurance policy we can fall back on when what we're building on, all our efforts falls apart? Uh, Are we building our lives on on Jesus and helping people that need help to be, uh, and who are struggling to be fastened to the rock which cannot move? Or do we just keep connecting with the same circles, like a little Christian clique? We're just in the same circles. You see, you know, we can come to church and sing, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. But what does that look like in the day-to-day? 
You know, we need to build our life on Jesus. We need to build our marriages, uh, raising our kids, our finances, uh, our work, uh, our relationships, uh, our spirituality, our mental well-being, uh, our commitment levels, our reliability, our service, our morality on the rock that is Christ Jesus. Why? Because he shows us how to conduct our lives in all of these areas. What he offers is foundational friends. What he offers is reliable. You know, Peter could write these things because this was his experience in partnering with Jesus Christ. Finally, we see that um, the church, uh, when, when the church has good foundations, it's able to declare the glory of God. And so, friends, the, the you know, the reason cities build towers is to declare the greatness of the city. You know, towers declare power. They declare wealth. They declare ingenuity. They declare status. They declare supremacy and splendor. You know, when the Tower of Babel was built in Genesis 8, uh, 11, verses 1 to 9, the, the tower symbolized human attempts to reach God through human efforts. It was all about how great are we humans? You see, friends, the pursuit of self-glory will always distract us from seeking God and his presence in our lives. The pursuit of glory will always dis dis distract, uh, distract us from seeking um, God and his presence in our lives. And I, and I think, you know, we're all prone to wanting a bit of glory, aren't we? We're all prone to this. You know, Peter wanted to remind the churches in Turkey that the life that we live, it's not about our glory. This is not to say that, you know, we can't be glorious. You know, I know loads of people who are glorious people. Glorious because they're first seeking God in their lives. And, and they're seeking the glory of God in their lives. They're glorious because they're first seeking God. You know, their lives, you know, what they do, it's about the Lord. You know, it's, it's his foundation that they're building on. And they, by grace, get some kickback of the glory of God as they seek the glory of God. You know, as we seek the glory of God, there's some kickback. We are going to be glorious. They get some kickback. You know, when we put God at the center of our lives, when we are at the center of his church, what are we doing? Peter says we're declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his glorious light, verse 9. And so, friends, this is what God chose us for. He chose us for declaration. And when we turn our lives over to Jesus through repentance and surrender at the cross, we become glory carriers, actually. We carry something to the glory of God. You know, when you surrender your life to Jesus, something the glory of God invades you, and you carry that glory for the rest of your days. You know, I went from being an anxious person to a glorious person. In weeks, I felt God's glory in my life. I told my family about God, my work colleagues about God, everyone I could meet about God, because I just felt his glory in my life. And so the point is this, friends. Jesus built the church as a vehicle for declaration. You know, last week when we had uh, the church on Gatley Green, that's what we were doing. And so we didn't do this as a one-off piece of nostalgia. Let's do, an, let's do an open air like we used to do 40 years ago. We didn't do it for that. We did this to model how our lives should be in our day-to-day -day moments. It was to remind us that both individually and corporately, we have been destined for declaration as the church of Jesus Christ. Now, when we go to the pub, when we have a meal, when we go for a walk, when we watch a game of footy, when we go fishing with a friend, when we go to our places of work, our lives are to be lives of declaration in every way that we live, in everything that we do, in every place that we go. Our lives are to be lives of declaration. We are to be the same in public 
as we are when we're at home in our Christian community. Our lives are built to declare Jesus. And so there's no off days when you, when you find Christ. Because his glory, if you let, allow it to invade your life and fill your life, it's there every day, 24-7. You just want to do something for the glory of God. You want to say something for the glory of God. You want to create something for the glory of God. You, 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 you want to, everything you, you do and touch to have something of the glory of God on it. And so there's no off days when the glory of God invades our lives. It's, it's, it's ever present. It's omnipresent. It's constant. It's a constant source. It's not like an electric car that runs out of, 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 of electricity. You've got to plug it in at the wall. It, it's constant. When we invite the glory of God into our lives, it's constant. It's there so that something of our lives and the glory in us declares the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the message of Jesus. That's what it's there for. There's no off days. We've been called to live lives that declare his wonderful life in the darkness that surrounds us. And it's a dark world we're living in, isn't it? But we're light carriers. We're, we're, we're light bearers. You know, when you think of things that are glory, they're often things associated with fire. And fire in the dark places lights up everything. And that's what we're, like. we're to be. We're to be beacons of light and hope and fire and passion. That's what God's called us for. Jesus said, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I'm not sure whether it was Jesus who said that. You'll have to fact check that. But I think, anyway, so our passage today says to declare the praises of him, to declare the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's just a great verse, that, isn't it? There's hope for us, friends. This hope for the church. We are rebuilt people, built for declaration. And so in conclusion this morning, let's take some time maybe today throughout the week, meditating on some of these areas. How can I become rock hard in my faith? I love saying rock hard <laughs> because I'm a northerner. I'm from Lancashire. He's, he's rock hard. We used to talk, we used to talk about our mates. Oh, he's, He's rock hard, him. He's rock hard. I love saying rock hard. It's good. But, you know, how can we become rock hard in our faith? What do my foundations look like? Are they firm and unshakable or crumbling? What am I building on? Good things to reflect on, aren't they? What does my declaration about Jesus look like? Am I open and vocal or am I closed in, shut off, and timid? Jesus wants us to be bold, open and vocal, declarative. And so I hope that's been an encouragement to you all this morning. I'm going to pray and ask that God would bless his word to us. And then we're going to, we're going to sing and we'll close the service. Lord, we want to thank you today that, Father God, you're, you, Lord, you know, can you get anything harder than... looking at a, a filthy world, a sinful world, an, an, an awful people, and having mercy on them, and willingly allowing your life to be arrested, put on trial, beaten up, bruised, bloodied, smashed to pieces, to walk through the streets bleeding and dying, exhausted, dehydrated. With a vision to get to a public place of execution and be hung and nailed to a wooden cross in front of a crowd of people hurling insults at you, people on the crosses beside you, questioning you, hurling insults at you. Spilling your blood, dying. Lord, that's rock hard. That's rock, it's rock hard to, Lord, descend into the depths of hell and disarm Satan and defeat him 
and rise from the dead victorious. It's rock hard, Lord. So this is the Jesus we follow. We pray that you'd make us harder in these days. We need to be strong. Make us stronger. We pray that our foundations would be constantly analyzed in all of our lives. All the things we're building on, help us to look at them. Help us to, Lord, have courage to speak about you. You are the most incredible person in human history. Give us courage to be people who say that Jesus is the Lord of all, the Lord of heaven and earth. Give us courage, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name.